everyone. I'm here with one of the not only the legendary um, ex Premier League keeper from the glory years of the '90s, Hans Seggers. Hans, welcome to CAS TV. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> so, um, Hans, great to have you on here. How's, th how's things been, Hans? What, what, what have you been up to? My last job in England was at Fulham. So that was uh, in 2014. So I left, uh, I left England for Holland. And literally, I joined, uh, actually, I joined two teams in the uh, second division in Holland. So one was uh, RKC Walwijk. And one was FC Eindhoven. So I worked uh, at both clubs as a part-time goalkeeper coach. And I've done that for three, four years. And I must say, I really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed right. it. You know. And, and um, so, uh, go on ahead. Go on ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's just, it's just you know, nice to, uh, you know, any level who you coach. You know, everybody's got his own level. And if you, you know, train these goalkeepers, you know, and they really appreciate you know what you've got to say and what you're going to do with these with these boys. So uh, yeah, fully enjoy it. With with um, those two clubs, um, what what do you, what is kind of your kind of been your experience? Because obviously FC Eindhoven, that's a local club where you obviously just to let everybody know you're obviously originally from Eindhoven. So this would be a club that you're very would be quite close to you. Is that right? Uh, this is a tricky question, Nick, because my heart was at PSV Eindhoven. So, you know, when I was a youngster, I went to uh, I went to PSV when I was 16 and I was there for six years. So I made it all the way down to the first team. And from there, I went to uh, Nottingham Forest. So, um, but there's a few uh, people who I worked at FC Eindhoven. I knew from the past when I was at PSV. And so there was just a very good relationship with them and a friendship. And that's the reason really I joined the uh, FC Eindhoven. Rather than peace behind Oven. Who was Hans in high school? So if I'm going to high school with Hans, tell, tell me who Hans who Hans is. They will tell you that Hans hated school, but he I was in one I... thing. But in one thing, he was excellent, and that was in sport. And whatever sport I did in uh, in school, I was uh, you know I was probably one of the 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 best or the better ones in any any sport so uh, my dad played as a fullback right fullback so in my school team i played right fullback and i went to an amateur club i, I played right fullback but the problem these days we had no goalkeeper and <laughs> we had to take it in we had to take it in turns so right, one week okay. it was my turn so, you know, we, I played and we won the game. And the week after, the coach said, Oh, Hans, I think you did quite well last week. You stay in. And I never went out again. <laughs> <laughs> and did, did you enjoy it? Um, did you really enjoy it? Uh, actually, I've, yeah, in the beginning, I got bored. And I think that's also the problem with uh, a lot of goalkeepers especially the youngsters when they join a team and you know once they join a, a a good team and they win every game 10 12 nil and you just stand there as a goalkeeper or the other way around you know you got a crap team and you stay there and you let 10 or 12 goals in then you don't enjoy it anymore and that's yeah. why i found uh, and that's why i found with a lot of goalkeepers in in holland once they play for a big team they play against other amateur sides. They just stand there, and right. uh, so it's not good for their development, so, basically. No, no, not at all. And uh, I was lucky enough that one of the dads that time, uh, when I played for the youth team, was prepared to kick some balls. He was not even a coach, but he was prepared to kick hundreds and hundreds of balls. Repetition, repetition. Mm. repetition and i loved it so you know during the week i got my workout but you know i was also one of the better teams uh, at the amateur side so in the game itself i didn't get much to do only against teams against psv or fc mm. eindhoven but there were there were good teams and then you know you got plenty to do and through that i got scout through the psv uh, scouting system and that's the yeah, that's also the reason I went there. And so, 
with, with like your, your parents and stuff, because obviously I'm sure you've got siblings and stuff. And so obviously high school, you just didn't enjoy it. Um, your parents, was your, your mom and dad, were they very supportive? Like your mom, was she, would you say she was an integral role and in really motivating you or encouraging you, things like that? They, they supported me every week. They went to every game, home and away, but I didn't need encouraging because I had, on that time, I was 16, 17. I had one thing in my mind. I wanted to be a professional footballer and any, nothing, nothing else. And so I put everything in. I was training three times a day just to, uh, you know, to be, you know, to be the best. I right. wanted to play at, I wanted to play in the first team at PSV. That was my target. So everything has to move and leave for that target. So, uh, and lucky enough, um, you know, I managed to get there. And so when you, when you look hands at like, um, kind of that journey, cause it's, it's interesting when you look at the journey of a, of a footballer, I always say it's the, when they have, uh, it's good to have a support behind you. So when you are going through tough times, you have a supportive family behind you that can really, you know what I mean? When things aren't going right for you, or maybe you're not in the team or you're, in, you're out injured or do you know what I mean? You've got different things going on in the background. What would you say? Like, um, for you, like, for example, what age was it for you when you realized, I want to be a professional footballer, or you thought, I'm good enough to be a player? What well, I just said, when I went to uh, PC Eindhoven, I was 16, mm. and I was also very fortunate that one afternoon, on the Thursday afternoon, I remember this so well, I was allowed to train with the first team. So that time there was a goalkeeper called Jan van Wieven and he was that time he was the best in, in Holland. So I had the privilege to, uh, to train with him. And for me, it was a, a boy's dream come true. So, you know, once you smelt it and you, you're quite mm. close, that, that was, yeah, that was said to you. That was the only one thing I wanted to do is playing professional. And then you need some luck to, uh, you know, that you don't get injured when you just sat, or, you know, the order is not a better goalkeeper in front of you, or is a better player in front of you. So it's, it's not always easy. It's, you know, it's for the outside, when players in, or goalkeepers, they play in the Premier League, you know, they, people think, oh, they had it easy, or, but, you know, beforehand, they don't see beforehand, when they started at eight years, 10 years old, you know, what Absolutely. they have to do to get there. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. uh, uh, but you know, I was lucky enough to uh, to you know to make my job for my hobby, and uh, you know, I see it still as a privilege now. Even you know, Absolutely. I'm I'm in a coach, even a coach now. I still don't see it as work. You know, I still see it as a hobby, and uh, I just love it. Yeah, and so so when you see when you see that when you see that passion, I mean, it's funny. I met up with one of my friends last week, and he's ex special forces. And one of the things he was saying to me is like, your why has to always be strong enough. Because he said, if it's not strong enough, you're not going to last. You're not in it for the right reasons. No. Basically. Do, do you know what I mean? That, no, you, 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 they, they spot on, you know, special, you know, that kind of job. Your, your mindset has to be, you know, unbelievable. And it's not always easy, you know. You, uh, right. A life from a professional doesn't go over over roses. You know, there's a lot of hurdles you have to get over, and yeah, yeah sometimes you get hurt. But then the the main thing is how you react, and that's what I always when I coach youngsters, how do you react if you make a mistake? Right. And uh, and a lot of youngsters find that difficult, uh, especially you know when they their mom and dad are watching. Uh, other parents are watching and they make a mistake and uh, you know they, or they get stick from the sidelines yeah that's these things happen in uh, in professional football but they also happen in the amateurs you know at the, by the youngsters when they you know starting from eight or ten years old you, you get already stick from the sidelines so uh, and yeah you have to deal with it and that's not always easy I always say to the youngsters the next ball is the most important one. You know, you could be important. You could be important again for your team. You know, okay, you make the mistake, but the next ball, you might have a great save, and your team, you know, come to one-one, or you win the game two-one. Then, then you you still, you know, you still 
are very important for the team because you don't let them to 2-0 down. So that's why I always say your, your next ball is the most important one. Right, okay. And so whenever you think about, obviously you're then at, at obviously PSV and obviously coming through this whole arena where you understand, listen, professional football is not going to be tough. Do you think in today's day and age, Hans, if you reflect back on your career and how you started and how your journey, um, way before you even went to England, but just prior to PSV, do you think that do you think that kids now, when they think about um, being a professional, do you think they think, well, I need to have a plan B, because what if this doesn't work out? <laughs> you know, actually, I think that's a very good idea. You know, think to uh, that players have that. You know, because everyone everyone wants to be a professional footballer. You ask all the kids who play football, do you want a professional footballer? They always say yes, because this, you know, for me, it's the best thing. And for these kids, it's the best thing ever. You know, they see Messi, uh, Ronaldo, and they see Courtois. They, they, you know, they, they love it. <laughs> uh, but not everybody can make it. So I think, and then the, that's where the parents are coming in. So some, oh, uh, uh, you know, be careful because, you know, if you don't make it, have something in the background where you can fall back on. So I think the school is still very important to do that uh, together. Um, you know, and later stage when you're 18, 19, then you can say, yeah, I go 100% towards the uh, professional. But uh, to have a plan B, I think is always very wise. Yeah. So, I mean, for like, so if you're looking at kids now, because, you know, somebody's saying like, I've obviously got, so you've obviously got a plan A and your plan A is to be, a, to be a footballer, right? Now, um, yeah. if I, if I kind of look at it from that perspective, do you think that a player has to really think, because if they have a plan B, then it means they don't really believe in their plan A. What do you, what do you think about it that like that from that perspective? Uh, I've, I've, you know, when you talk to these kids, uh, because everything could happen, the player can get injured. So let's say if you are 18, 19, you sign your first contract, but you get injured, you get serious injured and you got nothing to fall back on. So right. that's why, so it's not only when you not make it to the top, but also when something happens, you know, uh, you get hit, you get hit by a car middle of the road, uh, you know, and your career right. is finished. Why you got then? So always be prepared to uh, to fall back on something. You know that's why I always encourage youngsters. You know when when they're doing the football, you know do something next to it. Do a a course, a, 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 uh, do some course for whatever you uh, you're quite keen to uh, to develop. You know that could be as a coach, uh, or you go uh, you know whatever you want to. Uh, to be in the later life, but okay. I always encourage to do something because you know these players you know, they still have they, they train hard, but they still have got some spare time. So yeah, uh, there's to do no, things. Okay. So there's yeah. uh, there's nothing wrong to do something else, you know, to have a little uh, sniff or a little a little look in uh, whatever. That's actually helpful for a lot of people listening. You know what I mean? Um, to really think about what what they want to do alongside that. But because a lot of people, believe it or not, they want to stay in the football industry. They want to maybe do something else within football. They don't want to say, for example, they don't make it as a player. I mean, I've spoken to many students that tried to be players, but they failed, and so they went to do football business and marketing and just all kinds of yeah, courses, yeah. degrees, programs out there, coaching, talent identification. There's there's probably more now than when we would have been much younger. Obviously, you're much older. You're obviously 20, actually exactly 20 years older than me because <laughs> I was born in 1981. Oh. So, <laughs> but, uh, but, but basically, there's a lot more now, isn't there, than what there would have been, say, in the eight, 70s or 80s. Nick, if you look now, what, they, what they, the club needs to be supported, the staff was what is needed for, for a first team. And Nick, and I can tell you this, a perfect example is actually my son. Okay. My son was a goalkeeper. My son was a goalkeeper and I trained him. And I trained him a couple of days at, when I was at Spurs in the afternoon. Okay. And, and on one stage, uh, you know, he was very keen to be a professional footballer. And I had to say to him, 
So, so, his name is also Nick. He said, Nick, sorry, mate, but you, you just haven't got that to get to the top. You know, you have to need something right. to get to the top, something special. Right. And, oh, and obvious to say that to your own son, that's really, really hard. But if you look back at it, it's probably the best thing what I've ever done because that made him think, that made him do something else. So he went into fitness. So he got into the fitness. Um, he was a personal trainer. From personal mm-hmm. trainer, he, he studied uh, special, uh, as a speciality of uh, full football. Uh, he got his papers. He got a job. He, he came to Holland as well. I got him a job. He was there for six months. And people have walked away with him. And then he got signed for PSV Eindhoven. Oh, and PSV, wow. He was, yeah, and PSV, yeah, he was there for four years. And in the meantime, he's doing his master's now in, uh, in London. Oh, wow. He's been... So he's been away from PSV. He was there with the uh, second team. He went to the national team from Oman. So he went to the uh, he went to the desert. Oh wow! And he stayed okay. there. He, he stayed there. So he worked there for the national team for a year, and now he just signed a new deal with FC Twente for three years. So oh my goodness! Wow. Yes, so this is a perfect example from who mm. somebody who uh, just not good enough to make it to the top. He, you know, he wanted to stay in the sport. He'd done his fitness. From his fitness, he was personal trainer. Then he got uh, specialized in, in football. And, you know, and now he absolutely loves his job. He's absolute, yeah, he's best thing ever happened to him. So, so literally, so he would have been there. What year would that have been? So how old's your son now? How old's he now? My, my son is 32. 32 now. Oh, wow. Okay. So he basically, when he, when you told him that, what was his reaction when you said, listen, I don't think that, obviously being sensitive and stuff, but saying to him, you know, I'd listen, I'd, I'm not sure that, you know, it's going to happen for you here. What's the plan? He, uh, he was destroyed, you know, and then I thought, have I done the right thing to, okay. to be so harsh to, mm. towards him? Um, but, I was honest, you know, uh, my experience in the game was so that, you know, I, I could tell that he wouldn't have made it uh, professional. So right. he could put years and years effort in, in that. Uh, but, you know, I made him think of something else. And he said, okay, dad, um, you know, I, I want to stay in, in sport. So, and that's, you know, that's kept the ball rolling for him. Mm. And now he's a, he's a performance coach at FC Twente, just signed a three-year deal, and he's absolutely delighted. Right, so he's really, in, he's really enjoying his time, pretty much that he actually took that advice. Um, so that's a perfect example. I think that's a great example, Hans, actually. When you look at a lot of kids that yeah. don't make it, and they think, and they're just, as, they're just destroyed. Because the reality is, I mean, I was speaking to Sergei Baltacha, and he sent me this quote about how many players actually make it. And the reasons why they don't. And he obviously worked with Joe Gomez and Admola Luckman, who obviously went on to play yeah. Premier League and, you know what I mean, Bundesliga, respectively. And he was just saying to me that you, the amount of qualities you have to have, the kids and parents maybe sometimes don't understand. Do you know what I mean? How yeah. good you have to be yeah. to actually make it to the top level. But- um, so, so yeah. Hans, um, so as you kind of looked, obviously, so you obviously were at PSV, so you're obviously progressing through there, and obviously you went on. How many games did you play for the PSV first team? Uh, I think I've got 15. 15. I played the last three months uh, at uh, the, in the first team because that what they did... And I knew that already by that time, because my world absolute fell apart. They signed the goalkeeper Hans from Brooklyn. Okay. Uh, and Hans was the, the national goalkeeper from Holland. So he was at Nottingham right. Forest that time. Okay. So Peefy signed him. Peefy signed him. And I thought, you know, I, I was very young. So I thought, you know, I might have a chance to be the first team goalkeeper here. But they signed him. So my, my, my world fell apart. Right. So I trained with him. I stayed at PSV in the pre-season. And then Hans said to me, uh, so, you know, listen, Hans, um, at Nottingham Forest, they're still looking for a goalkeeper. If you want, 
I can make a call to Brian Clough and see what he right. says. So that's what he did. Okay. And uh, Clough, Clough, he said, oh, send them over. So I was supposed to be there for a you know, two-week trial. But after two days, Cluffy came up to me. Uh, hey, you silly Dutchman. I, uh, I like to have you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was the uh, that was the story with with Brian Clough. So uh, it was uh, it was entertainment with him. Brilliant, absolute brilliant. Would you say? Would you say? Because you, you, you and Roy, with Ian Roy Keane and a number of other players who played under Brian Clough, would you say he was the best manager that you ever worked under? He was uh, he, he was a man manager. Like, let's make it that way. He was like uh, he, to bring the best out of players. Because tactical, any tactical training or uh, a meeting, team meeting before a game, we ne we never did one. We never did one. Um, so, but man management, unbelievable. You went through uh, through a wall through that man and. Um, yeah. You know, I had I had four years at Nottingham Forest and I had a good time. You know, um, but also you know with ups and downs, got injured, done my knee ligaments, uh, lost my place in the team, got back in the team, uh, lost it again, went on loan a few times, got back to Nottingham Forest, and then uh, Wimbledon came knocking on the door. So you know, even your career is looks from the outside great, nice big club, Nottingham Forest, but even then. I had to cope with uh, all difficult situations. So, so when you when you looked at PSV, obviously PSV, they obviously won the they obviously won the Champions League in the eighties. So they were they were yeah. obviously they were very successful um, as a team. And um, so whenever you look at like um, PSV, right, and then you're going to another club, Nottingham Forest, because they had won they had obviously won two European Cups in the eighties. So they were very, right. you were going from one European superpower. I suppose kids now would think, oh, Nottingham Forest, what's, what are these guys talking about? They're in the championship. But basically, they were a very good team then. Yeah, if you, if you saw the, you know, actually, if you saw the players, you know, they were okay. There's a few outstanding players, but they're great as a team. You know, they had a great team spirit. Absolutely. They wanted... I think they won it twice on the trot, the 79 and 80. Uh, That's right. Uh, yep. Yeah. That's right. So, you know, so to join that team and with that history, you know, that was already unbelievable. And for me to play in the, uh, to coming to England, for me it was the, a boy's dream. Because, right. um, you know, because if you, um, you know, in Holland we had BBC already. So at half past 11 here, half past 10 in the UK, you know, I was watching a uh, match of the day every week. Because I thought okay. the, I thought the, the football, the, the pace, the passion, the the crowds, uh, you know, for me the English football had everything. And so to come to uh, to England to Nottingham Forest for me that was a actually was a dream come true, Nick. Absolute, brilliant. So around around this time, obviously you're going to obviously your, your career is progressing. You're going out and obviously a bit ups and downs. Around this time, um, obviously, in terms of getting into the Dutch as youth international, um, why do you think you were overlooked? Do you think, or why you weren't given more of an opportunity within Holland's under twenty ones and national team? That's the that's the question I got asked quite a lot of times in England, actually. Mm. Um, by that time. Um, you got picked if you played abroad, you know, your your you Rijkaard, your you Koeman, your Marco van Basten, uh, all these all these players, you know, they are they were top. They were top notch. And they saw me playing for, you know, I had a great time at Wimbledon, did very well at Wimbledon, you know, finished even in the top six with Wimbledon. Yeah. Um, I remember but, that. You know, and <laughs> Yeah, so you know, reporters as well—they couldn't believe it why I was not involved in the uh, Dutch squad. But uh, here we go. It's uh, it's it's a shame. But at that time, I didn't. Yeah, let's make it that way. I didn't even think about it. You know, after afterwards, you think mm, it's a shame that you're not involved in the Dutch uh, Dutch side. But you know, uh, I had a great time. You know, I'll. Uh, 
you know, I put everything in in the eight years I was at Wimbledon. So uh, they can't take that away. And so, you know, when like you went out and loan, how did you find the loan spells at Stoke City and Sheffield United? You know, and you look at Sheffield United now, they're doing so well in the Premier League. Um, Chris Wilder's done a phenomenal job. Actually, it's very working, very working class club, very different to the two clubs in PSV and Nottingham Forest. What would you say you learned that you think you, that a player needs to think of when he's going out and loan? So kind of Dean Henderson, who's there on loan right now for Manchester United. What do you think in, you know what I mean, in comparison to where you were at that, at that point in your career versus like a Dean Henderson, who everybody are touting as a, a future Manchester United number one? What, uh, for me, the most important thing, I was at PSV, and what you said earlier, PSV in Holland is probably one of the biggest, together with Ajax, the Absolutely. biggest club in, in, in Holland. In, in Europe, also a big club. But for me, the most important thing was I need to play. I wanted to play. And I, I would have gone anywhere if I made sure wow. I would play. So... I uh, even said, you know, to, to my friends and to my agent, you know, even if I get half of the money, I don't care. I want to play. Right. I'm a football player. I'm a goalkeeper. I want to play. So that was the key factor for me everywhere when I went. I went to Nottingham Forest, got out of the team. Um, I went to uh, Cluffy. I said, uh, boss, uh, I came to England for just one thing and to play and not to sit on the bench. Even at that time, they had only one sub or three subs. That's uh, right. With no, yeah, with no goalkeeper on the bench, so I was sitting in the mm. stand. And I must say, uh, you know, Cliff, you said, you know, okay, I'm happy with that. So that's why I went to Stoke. I went to Sheffield United. Uh, I went even to Dunfermline. Just to one thing, to uh, gain experience. Because the more you play, the more experience you get, the better you're going to be. And that's why I did. Mm. And then you, so you pretty much, so how did you find, because those are four very different hubs. Stoke City, <laughs> which everybody, Stoke get a bad rap pretty much in England, even now. Um, and then, of course, Sheffield United, um, who were, they were decent at that time. But then going all the way north, up to play in the SPL in the Scottish Premier League. So what would you say, the difference was between those three clubs and what would you say you learned? How would you say it developed you as a player and as a person? When I came to uh, Stoke, it was actually for, uh, for one, one month. And Peter okay. Fox was, I think, was the, was the goalkeeper and he was injured. So okay. I played one, one game for Stoke and then Peter got fit again. So he played again, and then I went back to Nottingham Forest, really. So my spell at Stoke was very short, but uh, I went to Sheffield United. Uh, I was there for three months, and right. that's and I really enjoyed that. Really enjoyed that. Uh, we trained at the university. It was top of the hill. Uh, it was gale force wind. It was rain <laughs> every day. <laughs> Uh, because you know, I, I joined them from November till end of January, I think it was. So the weather was horrendous, but <laughs> I played, and that's for me. It was all that matters. Yeah. So I had a, you know, had a good, had a good time there. We enjoyed it. Um, came back to uh, Nottingham Forest, and then uh, I had a phone call from uh, from Scotland. Yeah, from uh, I thought it was Jim McLeish. Yeah, there was the, the coach down there. Okay. So uh, he, went, he went to see one of the games. And uh, so I went to Scotland. So I flew up on a Friday, played the game, and flew back on a Sunday. So I trained all week at, uh, at Nottingham. And then I just uh, went up there for the game. And again, for, for that, I was, I thought the Scottish League was very demanding. Physical. It was, yeah, very much so. Of, oh, I, I thought the English <laughs> League was tough, but... Right. Then I went to Scotland. Scotland, boo, that was a, that was an experience. But then again, you know, you learn from it, and yep. uh, so I brought that back with me back to England. And then, you know, I got the phone call from Bobby Gold. He was then the manager from uh, Wimbledon, and he said, the, uh, "Yeah, I would like you uh, to have here, you know, because one thing you have, you uh, <laughs> you got personality and you got a great kick." He said to me. And that's why we need at the club. Right. Okay. 
funny, I was speaking to Jackie McNamara, um, who obviously I know quite well, and Jackie was, his dad actually played for Dunfermline. I think he was actually the manager there at one point. And, uh, and he, he was saying to me, you know, how tough the Scottish League was. So you, would you say, because if you look at like Wimbledon, because you were replacing a very, a top goalkeeper in Dave Besant, at that time, because they yeah. just won the yeah. they just won the FA Cup, hadn't they? The previous season, which was, uh, which was I believe that was against Liverpool when they beat Liverpool one 0 um, and Dave Dave Besson scored the penalty. I actually have spoken to him about that penalty, and I asked him what he was thinking of going through that mind, and he was in, and he said he's never been so nervous <laughs> in his life because <laughs> Liverpool being the force they were, he said he said it couldn't be against a better striker than John Aldridge. You know what I mean? Um, Good. Yeah, I can see. <laughs> so it's 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 quite interesting. So you know, so one of the things I would like to ask you before we just dive into kind of your tenure with with Wimbledon, which I think is is quite important for people to understand. So if you think about where you've come from, so you've went from the academy at PSV, you've got into the first team, right? Um, you've got into the first team, and you've had all these moves, and then unsettling moves. So for example, your four year stint with Nottingham Forest, um, or with Forreston. And so, what would you say for a keeper anywhere in the world right now, if he's thinking about, listen, I want to come and I want to be a professional goalkeeper. And being a goalkeeper is the only position. It's not like being a, in a back four or two centre halves, because you might have maybe six, seven centre halves mm-hmm. in a first team. A goalkeeper is maybe you want yeah. maybe two or three at the most. And if you're a third choice keeper, you're probably not going to see a taste of the first team at all. So, um, unless there's some sort of injuries that happen, but but what would you say yeah. goalkeepers' mentality needs to be if they're going to come and play, for example, in in a place if you're from America, you're on the other side of the world, and you want to come and play over here, um, in in continental Europe, like Holland, Belgium, Germany, France, or England, what would you say? What would their attitude need to be? Do you think Hans, in order to do that mentally? The, the probably the most important thing is to have to be patient, right? Um, that that's something I struggle with. <laughs> and be honest right. with you, because if I go want if I go somewhere, I want to play and want to go play in the straight in the first team. Uh, but you know, if if a goalkeeper comes and you know, you, you have to be patient. You have to be get used to the you know, obvious to the country, to the to the players. To the new the coach, uh, you know all kind of different things, and sometimes you know, and I work with a lot of foreign goalkeepers in the past in England as well. And sometimes they want they want to think too early, and they get disappointed, so they come in a very negative mood. So, but if they say, okay, I give myself uh, I don't know three, four, or half, six months time, you can work towards that. So, uh, yeah, the key is. Patience and just you know, and know the culture, know your players, uh, and then go from there. Because that's that's the for me that's the biggest downfall that uh, goalkeepers or players get impatient uh, with the situation where they're in as a uh, as an outsider or as a foreigner coming into the country. So yep. that will be that will be my advice. So uh, you know, give yourself time. I do face. I, I, I do. I do Facebook. Okay. So and uh, okay. so that's all. That's all I have on the moment. So I'm not very keen. You don't on have Instagram time. You're a bit like me. I'm not a big, <laughs> not a big user of it. You know what I mean. So mm. I can definitely relate to that. Um, and so, uh, like I say, it's it's been great. It's been great. It's been great speaking, Hans. And what I would say is, uh, pretty much good luck. For, it's going to be obviously good luck for the season. And um, Thank you, Nick. We'll, we'll definitely look, we'll definitely look forward to obviously having you do some goalkeeping clinics. That's where we would definitely like to see and obviously talking to goalkeepers where they can kind of where we can maybe possibly arrange that when we're in in Holland um, mm-hmm. with groups of the boys from obviously our uh, international academy um, and stuff like that. So it'll definitely be very very helpful. So guys, any comments yeah. you want to leave? You can leave them in the section below, um, and don't forget to hit the notification squad to subscribe for more interesting content from both myself and Hans.